Hello everybody. Welcome. I don't know how important it is for the people who listen to my videos to see my face. Um, sometimes it's nice just to hear the speaking, but I'd like to be able to have like a little studio, you know, where I could make podcasts and where I could have a whiteboard or a clear board, but I don't know if uh, that's ever going to happen. It's wonderful to be in the garden. Mm. But it's not only wonderful. Sometimes it's sad. In some indigenous ceremonies, there is a part of the ceremony where we may promise to work hard. And I don't know what the original words meant. I don't know if they meant to work in the way that English connotates this word. And really there's many things I don't know, but I think perhaps what is meant is I will bring the best of me to life today. And I will try each day to bring the best of myself to the world and to my relationships and to the beings and places that I love, which might be all beings and all places. And so we say something like, I will work hard. But I don't think the meaning is work. And it's not even, it can't merely be an admonition to not be lazy because when we speak this way in ceremony, we mean something sacred, we mean I will bring the light I was given in this birth to life each day, even if I'm struggling. And all of us struggle. All the human beings have struggles. And all the living beings, they have struggles. So sometimes it can be very difficult to bring the best of ourselves to life in a phase of our life or in a situation or in a time of our life. Sometimes it can be very difficult. There are all kinds of situations and things that make it more or less difficult. And 
And sometimes even when we really try, we just can't quite make it, you know? Something's wrong. Something's missing. We're broken inside, or something is broken, or we're sick, or we're confused, we're isolated, we're helpless, we're alone. And then it can be very difficult to bring the best of ourselves to life in the day when we are struggling. And the human world is not very good for helping us with this. In fact, it's often explicitly bad at helping us with this. It just makes things worse. <laughs> hmm. And so sometimes even though we want to bring the best of ourselves to life, Even if we try very hard, and we cannot do it. <clears throat> in the past couple of days in this part of the garden, I met beings who were in trouble. I, w I wanted to help, help them. I tried to help them. I tried hard. But I couldn't help them. And they died even though I wanted them to live. They were just small beings, you know. One was a butterfly. who couldn't inflate his or her wings. It was the wrong timing. And I tried to help the butterfly, but there wasn't much I could do. And the butterfly passed away over the night. And the ants came and got it. And then this is a time in the moon cycle when many of the bumblebees are dying. And yesterday, I saw an old queen, bumblebee, and she was fighting very hard to live. She was trying to get some nectar from a flower. She couldn't fly anymore, so she was crawling around on the flower, trying to get some nectar. And I'm pretty experienced at helping bees get back into the air. It seems kind of, may seem a kind of trivial skill, but it's not. Because helping living beings who are struggling at the edge of birth or death is a noble thing to do. It's not noble because we think it is noble. It's simply noble. <laughs> One of my neighbors I don't know her actual position but she's a natal trauma nurse so she helps women and babies who are struggling with being born and giving birth or giving birth and being born
button for anyone who's sensitive. It's pretty tough to do a job like that if you're not. It's much tougher if you are. <laughs> Work like that seems to me to be very noble and heroic and beautiful and sacred. Now see, if you could not see my face, you would still hear my voice and you would be able to tell something is painful. It's hurting. I'm hurting. Sometimes when I've tried to help living beings, I can be confused or naive or I can make a mistake and they die. But in this case yesterday, with the old queen, she really wanted to live and I really wanted to help her live. So I spent probably an hour and a half with her, holding her, warming her, bringing her nectars from flowers and squeezing out the nectars so she could drink them. And after a while she started to get energetic and it was cold, it wasn't sunny. It was cold, had it been sunny, we might have succeeded. I knew she might not live. I knew when I started. <laughs> She might not live. She might not be able to get back into the sky. I knew. But I tried to help her in every way I could think of. And after a while she became very energetic and I could feel her body humming. And she was working hard. She was trying hard to get back into the sky so she could go home for the night. Her body was healthy enough, but her wings were very old. And they were tattered. And so little pieces of her wings were missing. And even though she had the energy to fly again, her wings couldn't lift her. I tried lots of things to help her, but her wings couldn't lift her. And I couldn't carry her home because I don't know where her home is.
And this might seem like a lot of emotion over a bee. <laughs> when I was young, the adults would often blame me for this. <laughs> they would say, why are you so upset? It's just, a, it's just an insect. It's just a snail, it's just a little creature. But I can love little creatures very much. Even if we've only just met, and especially if they're in trouble and they need help. I placed her on these flowers. And eventually she fell down into the leaves. And I don't know what became of her after that, but she could not fly, so... It was her last time. I gave her very sweet nectars. I was trying to help. But I couldn't fix it. Today, when I was taking a shower, there was a spider who I didn't see at first. And once I saw him, I tried to rescue him from the shower. I don't know if I succeeded, I don't think so. I don't want things to die so that I can live. Yet lots of things have to die so I can live. At least in the world as we live in it today. And some of you might wonder, you know, what is in my mind? Why am I crying on a video to people I don't know? Sometimes people have thought of me that I am an intelligent person and a creative person and a person who has some wisdom. Perhaps some people have thought these things. And maybe I have thought them myself, too. That my actual nature is not to be intelligent. It's to be loving. And I love really easily. It's very easy for me to love. I especially love living beings. <laughs> no, I mean, I love everything. But I'm crying today because it's really hard to be human. And it's very ironic because we have unimaginable luxuries in our time. Things our people never dreamt of as even being possible yet. These luxuries often make it more difficult to be human. More challenging because they bury our light, these luxuries. And we become content with replacements for relationships and love and meaningful roles in relation and caring and gentleness and kindness. And sometimes I feel like that bee and I often feel like that butterfly. I can't get my wings to fill up. I can't get back into the sky. And down here on the earth, I will die. It's too lonely. It's too confusing. The humans are cruel and their collectives are vicious and ignorant and bent on killing.
But sometimes even when we try really hard and we do our best, sometimes still it doesn't work, you know? There's so many living beings here that if I even are, if I am walking here, I am killing creatures. They're dying. I can't see them. They're very small. I crush them with my footsteps. And I don't want to. So I try to stay aware, you know, when I am walking. It's extremely difficult to be aware if one has a phone in one's hand. In fact, it's probably impossible. These leaves. This shape here. Many different things could eat the leaves, but that looks like maybe a leaf cutter bee. It's one of my favorite creatures. I really like them. They're really cool. But I like all the creatures. Sometimes in life, extremely painful things happen, and some people might think, and I'm not really con very concerned with what some people might think. Apparently, Humans spend way too much time thinking about what other people might think, the possible thoughts of possible others. But some people might think, well, <clears throat> geez, Darren, why don't you do something actually useful or meaningful with all of this loving care and awareness you have? Why are you busy trying to help bugs in the garden? And obviously, there's some part of me that can entertain that, that concern or that criticism. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hello. But the little beings, they're very important and they matter and they are actual beings. Just like the earth or an elephant or a whale or a human. They are actual beings, and there's no one that can help them. If someone doesn't help them, if a human doesn't help them, there's no one who can help them on Earth, in the physical world. So, then I don't only try to help them. Or rather, I don't try to help only them. <laughs> there are humans that I love and have tried to help too. And sometimes I will try to help a human who I've never met. But what I'm trying to communicate about is that sometimes in life, it's just very difficult to be human and to have feelings and to feel helpless and alone and frightened and concerned and unable to rescue those beings that we love when they most need us or they are dying or they are sick or they're injured or they're badly confused or they're terrified. Sometimes it can be really hard to help. 
And sometimes it's worse than that. Sometimes in trying to help, we get it wrong. And we cause more harm. Even though we may be trying very hard. Often we are confused because of how we think or our, the habits we've developed over our lifetime. And so we cannot see clearly what is needed. We do instead what is habitual to us and this doesn't work. <clears throat> when I was a child, and not only when I was a child, I was pretty naive in, in many ways, and some of those ways were beautiful and innocent and good, but some of them were also very confused. Like, as if I thought the world was a cartoon story. <laughs> that kind of confusion. And so sometimes just because I wanted a living being to go with me in my life, they ended up dying. Sometimes very tragically or horribly. Because I thought as a little child, well, I can put the fish in my pocket. There's the Cooper's Hawk couple. I love them. Powerful animals. They are beautiful animals. Over there, it's ironic. There's a blue plastic barrel. Maybe you can see it. A few years ago, one of their children died in that barrel because the humans are stupid and keep making artifacts everywhere that are, that are artificial in ways that get living beings killed. And their child was a fledgling and it was a mystery what happened at first. I discovered inside the barrel the corpse of the drowned corpse of one of their children. The, bar the barrel was half filled with water. And it's about four feet tall, maybe two and a half feet in diameter. <clears throat> Took me a long time to figure out how the hell that bird got stuck in that barrel and had to die there. But the edge of the barrel is very thin, you see, and the bird cannot grip it with its, with its feet. And so it flew up to the edge of the barrel, but on the balancing move it would normally make, when it managed to grip the edge, which it couldn't grip, it lost its balance and fell into the barrel. And once it was in the barrel, in the water, it could not fly. And the water was too deep for it to stand up in, and it could not get back into the sky, you see and it died there. And I found it. And I couldn't save it. And I was thinking about how our own minds and lives are like this. We just don't realize that the technologies the humans make are deadly. Nearly all of them. They're deadly to parts of us we don't even know exist because we never get introduced to them. We get introduced first to the machines and the language and the concepts and the accounting games and the judgments and courtrooms and criticisms and wars. We don't get introduced to the original light. I could not save 
the young bird, I was too late. But as a gesture of respect, I found something with which to remove it from the barrel because I knew that that was probably the last thing on its, its soul and mind were aching to be released from that barrel. Maybe it was no help, but I took it out of the barrel and set it gently on the grass. And I feel like that bird. Many of my friends are like this bird, except they are not yet drowned. They're still flapping in the barrel and calling out and no one is coming to help them. But what I wanted to speak about today is that it is good when we can try hard to bring the sacred light of our spirit to life in our day, in our relations with ourselves, and those beings near to us, even perhaps those beings who we think of as enemies or who are unkind or cruel to us. <clears throat> this is not the only way sometimes we have to fight. If someone's being unkind or cruel, sometimes we have to fight. But hmm. many of the male, hum, the male, um, Bumblebees, they're passing away in this time. Some of the females too, obviously. I don't know what happens, I don't know how they survive. Some of them, I think, live. Maybe the older ones that die, and the males. Sometimes, we will have times in our life when we just feel helpless. We can't save anything. We can't save ourselves. We don't know what to do. We can't sleep. We can't eat. We have illnesses. We don't know why we are sick. We may have terminal illnesses. We may have illnesses that could become terminal. We may be badly injured. We may be alone or very poor and have no money and nowhere to go and no one who will care for us, and no one who will shelter us. And we just have to take care of ourselves, even though we can't take care really of anything in, this, in a time like this. And so it's very hard. So what do we do then when we are failing, when we are not succeeding at bringing the light to life in our, in, our, in our days, in our hearts, in our world? What about when things actually suck? What about when we're actually just too overwhelmed to do anything more? What about when we're tired, exhausted, alone, unloved, hungry, or trapped with people who are cruel and mean or noisy or toxic. What about when we don't know what to do and we can't figure it out? What about when we're hungry or cold and have no shelter or food? What about when we run out of money and can't work and there's no help? What about when we're trying to help a living being that we love and we fail and it dies? Or what if we don't fail and it dies? What if the one we love just dies and it's not our failure that caused it, but the pain of their loss 
is very powerful. We feel it. It affects us. Sometimes when things are very difficult, and it may seem like most of these stories I've told are relatively trivial, but I'm using gentle stories on purpose. There are times when millions of people die. There are times when all the animals die. The humans are burning down the forests and poisoning the oceans, and they're succeeding at that seemingly impossible task. Quickly, too. So what about when it's all broken and there's no hope? We can't find hope in our hearts. We can't find light in our hearts. So we can't bring it forth since we can't find it. What about that? What can we do then? Sometimes when things are very difficult, trying hard doesn't mean succeeding. <clears throat> Sometimes it might mean allowing things to be as they are and just being very present with them, with those feelings of helplessness, with the feeling of hunger, with our illness, with our injury, with being broken, with being alone. We can just come into presence with that. for our own sake and for the sake of all beings. And not present in our thinking, present in our being. We can wrap the arms of our soul around the terrible trouble and hold it gently and lovingly. And if we can't do that, that's okay too. Sometimes we can just surrender, just let go into whatever it is that's happening. We don't have to be the one who fixes everything or judges everything or feels everything. So sometimes we can just be present with exactly what is happening what is really happening, not our thoughts, not our fears, though we can be present with those too. We can just be present with what's happening. As I was yesterday with the bee. Once she had renewed her energies to the point where I could see she was physically capable of flying if she could fly, I knew she couldn't fly. I knew her wings wouldn't lift her anymore. So now what do I do? Well. I stayed with her for a while, made sure she got some more nectar, some more warmth, some more love, some more care in this life before the big night comes for her. It's not a perfect solution. Perfect solutions only exist in abstract frameworks. And even then they're not perfect. They simply fit the criteria of perfection closely enough that we call them that. Also, we have to <clears throat> Be gentle with our own hearts because, look, we're going to fail at all kinds of things, right? Sometimes terribly, sometimes we're going to fail terribly. We're going to make bad mistakes where other beings are hurt or killed. We are hurt or killed. We fail to intervene in a situation that results in the death or agony of other beings. All of these things are part of being alive. We don't just get the happy fairy tale story. And most of the fairy tales aren't happy and we should be very careful about basing our lives on these ideas. <clears throat> so
so sometimes to when when to have the sense of I will work hard in some situations we can't work at all it just I'm not working it doesn't work it's broken I'm broken it's not working I can't do it and in those situations some of what we can do is just to have compassion for ourselves for our humanity for our nature as beings mortal beings for our nature as human beings for our nature as animals for our nature as in in souled beings <laughs> except i think it's more like in being souls <laughs> right it's more like souls that have an embodiment aspect than it is bodies that have a soul aspect which is how the language usually portrays it sometimes it's important to let go and release the pain the tension and fear <laughs> a little little mouse <laughs> yesterday i saw a family of voles <laughs> they're really they're just great <laughs> i love all the little creatures We can let go. And sometimes to walk in beauty with all beings and all of time means just to be gentle. We don't always have to be the hero. We don't have to always succeed. Sometimes we will fail. Sometimes we will get things terribly wrong. Sometimes we will have an accident. Sometimes we will become an accident. All kinds of things can happen to us as humans. We cannot be prepared for all of them. And even to the degree we can be prepared, it's insufficient. So sometimes we have to be fluid and flow with what is happening now not worrying about the, the, the past or our history, not concerning ourselves with the future and its unknowns and frightening potentials, just flowing with things as they are right now. Coming back to this moment, drawing ourselves into coherence in the moment we are in, in the situation we are in however troubling it may be, however frightening it may be, however incapable of coping with it we may feel. There's an aspect of our being as humans that isn't exactly invulnerable, but it cannot be har harmed by ordinary things. It cannot be harmed by pain, loss, cannot be harmed by torture, agony, confusion, insanity. We don't have a lot of direct experience of this aspect, but it's always, it's always there. It's always here. <laughs> and if we are very tangled up in pain and fear and grief and anger and so on, if we can just release some of that tension, then naturally we begin to flow. So sometimes bringing the best of us to light is accomplished by releasing our grip, just letting go and flowing naturally 
with the situations and circumstances and events and relationships that we are engaged with or even that are missing from our lives. And sometimes that's a lot less hard than trying to be the one controlling everything or the one responsible for everything or the one whose fault it is or the one who determines whose fault it is the one who wants to blame and fight and argue though sometimes these things are necessary and important too so when it's very dark and we're confused and alone and we feel frightened and hopeless and it's broken and we're broken inside sometimes we can just relax and let that be stop fighting so hard from one perspective three quarters of the time when we're fighting we're fighting ourselves <laughs> we're fighting our own mind we're fighting our desire to fight it doesn't work out well. It does not resolve well. So let there be some space in our hearts and our awareness for crisis and failure and illness and death and loss and confusion, psychosis, isolation injury. We don't need to invite it. There will be plenty of time for all that stuff in our lives. But when it shows up, maybe we can slow down and not just try to control it, but actually pay attention in a deep, heartful way. Pay clear uncommitted attention, right? Just free attention flowing into the situation and our hearts and our bodies, our souls, our relationships. Sometimes we have to be very gentle. And sometimes to work hard means to know when to be gentle, when to be kind or even when to let go, when to release our grip on something. People all over the world are suffering and confused. They're not only suffering or confused. Some of them are having joyful moments or are in love or have just had a child or, you know, something beautiful is happening with them. Could be a very small adventure. But there are billions of people on the world and only a very small portion of them enjoy the incredible luxuries that we in the West have stolen from the future. We've stolen them by killing future time so we can have mostly meaningless luxuries now. It's a very tragic thing. But even this, you know, we cannot control the humans. We can forge intelligent collectives or not, but we cannot control what the collectives are doing. They are like monsters, they eat everything. They kill everything. And even while delivering us luxuries, they kill us inside all these machines and all of the noise and the terrible light of the machines and the terrible necessities of serving them and being subject to them. Yeah, this will pass in time, but for now, this is the time we live in. So 
So when you are feeling hopeless and confused and alone and you are wondering if there will ever be anything beautiful in your life again, it's okay to have those questions and to have those feelings. It's okay. But don't bind too closely to them because in the mind that is gripped by its own pain and confusion, the openness of possibility and of living often disappears. And that openness is always there, even if we are indeed about to die. And the frank truth is, I don't know what to do. Sometimes I just cry. I don't know how to fix the world or even simple situations in my own life that have become very problematic for me or that I have made problematic with my ignorance or my grasping or my fear or my anger or my frustration. I don't know. I have to keep walking though. I keep walking and that's part of, that's another part of the answer. Just continue. Just keep going, you know. Continue to live and grow and learn each day. Even if it's very confusing or frightening, even if you feel alone or helpless, or like, even if you are sure the catastrophe must come soon in the future. We often have this feeling, it's not untrue, but neither is it true. It's it's part of a suite of feelings that arise when we feel very helpless at, at the core of our being, yeah. Then we can know despair and other feelings like this. Just keep going, keep walking, keep dreaming at night, be gentle with yourself love yourself. Let there be some space for peacefulness and joy, even if it's very small. And recognize the beautiful things that are still part of your experience moment to moment. One other useful practice is just gratitude, right? The first time I see the sun in the day, I take off my hat and I adore the sun and I'm thankful to the sun, not just the sun, the holy beings, all of the beings, the living beings, the living places. <clears throat> Sometimes when things are very grim, if we just begin to practice gratitude, gratitude for the time I had with the bee, not, not so concerned with did I rescue her or not, Gratitude for the time I had with the butterfly, not so concerned with did I rescue her or not. Gratitude for understanding what happened finally to the young hawk who died in the barrel. Ridiculous travesty. But gratitude for being included in that circle, in that sacred circle of life and death and trauma and ecstasy. This gratitude is a very powerful thing to practice, especially when things have become grim and we feel very trapped. It's gratitude. You can't, it's not a thought thing. No, 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 no. One doesn't think, oh, I'm grateful for da, 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 da. Though if that's all you can muster, go ahead and do that, that's enough. If you can't actually feel it all the way down in your heart, keep practicing it as if you felt it. Right, that is, that is part of working hard, part of bringing your light back to life. But don't merely think it if you can manage it, you have to feel the gratitude, right? The same way you taste the food. Um, when you're really hungry, right? And you really taste the food, you have to have a visceral gratitude. Well, you don't have to, but go in this direction, yeah? So these are some of my thoughts about 
I will do my part, I will work hard. I will walk in beauty with the many beings for the many beings in all of time. Not because there's something particularly noble or special about me, but because I love them. <laughs> I just love them. I can't help it. I don't have to try. I just love them. I naturally love them. <laughs> I want them all to have beautiful, fulfilling lives and existences and relationships and... Mm. So these are some of my thoughts today about how to, how to work with the situation when we feel really broken and helpless. What can we do then? And there's still much we can do. Even when we cannot resurrect the feeling of hope in our hearts, there is still much we can do. So you can release your grip, that, that, that grasping, gripping feeling inside ourselves. We can release that. But uh, let's stay in the world with us. Yeah. Alive, learning, growing together. Continue onward, wayward one. And we will go together and stand once more in the beautiful light of a day and the world. <laughs> and the noise and destruction will not long trouble us. Practice being gentle. Remember the possibility of gratitude for the many blessings and protections that we enjoy each day, even when we are suffering, even when we are frightened, even when we are feeling despair. And reach out to someone who cares, someone you trust. If you can find someone, if you can't find someone, maybe be that someone. Try to be that someone for someone else. Reach out. Reach back toward nature, the sky, the living places, the mountains, the forests, the rivers, the lakes, the meadows, the deserts, the frozen places the valleys, the oceans, the plants and animals, the insects. Reach out, reconnect, spend some time in wonder, in remembrance, in beauty. Bye-bye for now.